Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the first lecture of our microcontroller course. I'm Cecil Germs, as many of you might know, and I am looking forward to sharing this course with you. Obviously, the first question which we can ask ourselves is, what in the world is a microcontroller? Well, it's an electronic device, and it's usually packaged in an integrated circuit. In other words, all the transistors and resistors and capacitors are all packaged together in one chip, an integrated circuit. And uh, this integrated circuit can be programmed to do a specific function or do more than one specific functions. Alternatively, it can control the operation of a device or it can be the interface between some other sensor and the outside world. So for instance, in the first case, your washing machine is a device. It needs to know which uh, programs to run and how long to wash and how long to spin and so forth. And typically nowadays, all of that is done inside of a microcontroller. In the second case, uh, if one has a sensor, for instance, for temperature, and you'd like to send the value of the sensor over the internet and uh, be able to read the temperature, maybe the humidity as well, remotely over the internet, then you would have the sensor connected to a microcontroller, which would then drive the sensor and send the values over the internet. And I might mention at this stage that the word microprocessor and microcontroller, uh, those words are often used interchangeably for a microcontroller. The uh, distinction between the two is often blurred and uh, the one word is used as much as the other. Now, it would be difficult for us to work with a microcontroller from the point of a, a hobbyist because uh, typically they are very small chips and uh, with many connections to them and uh, needing some interface and electronics around them. So typically we will only be working with what are, we refer to as microcontroller boards. Or alternatively, uh, they are often called breakout boards. Uh, a microcontroller board is, whatever microcontroller it is, soldered along with some surrounding interface electronics, uh, the connections that we can make to it, the uh, maybe some capacitors, maybe a crystal to make sure that it keeps time uh, and this is typic these are typically soldered together onto a small printed circuit board. Now there are many types of microcontrollers they are counted in the tens uh, less than a hundred I think we would be able to say but there are a multitude of microcontroller boards or breakout boards for these various microcontrollers. Uh, there are hundreds of these. And uh, so we, we're not necessarily going to handle all the microcontrollers and all the boards, but uh, we will. I've designed the course to cover a wide representative set of 
these microcontroller boards or, or breakout boards. Now the, the microprocessor itself, which is the chip, and the board on which it is soldered uh, are often used interchangeably. The names are used interchangeably. Um, let me illustrate this. Uh, for instance, here in the top left, we have three Arduino nano boards. Uh, they are called Arduino because the guy who was designing them couldn't think of a nice name to call them and he thought, oh well, I'll call them after a pub down the road that I often go to. But um, whatever they are referred to now as Arduino boards, this is the nano shape, but the actual microcontroller on it, that little black square there, uh, is actually an 80 mega 328p chip made by this company. Uh, Atmel Microelectronics. Uh, in a similar way, this board, that's the actual microcontroller made by the company ST Microelectronics and the fancy name or number for that chip up there is the STM32F103C8D6. But um, we typically, in this format, lovingly refer to it as the blue pill board. Um, the name comes from the form The Matrix. If you've watched it, you probably will know how it works. Here on the left at the bottom, there's what we would refer to as the Vroom 32. Um, I don't know how that one got that name. And uh, so this, this whole board will be referred to as the, as the Vroom or the Vroom 32. But the chip itself sits inside this little silver box uh, and it's shielded because it's, it's a radio chip as well. So it needs the shielding of the little silver box. And that is an ESP32 chip, uh, which is made by Espressive, a company in China. And uh, so that's the chip. This is the board. And uh, also we have the Raspberry Pi people who put out the Raspberry Pi a couple of years ago, uh, have now branched out and designed their own microcontroller chip or de designed a chip for themselves, uh, the RP2040. And uh, if you take that and solder it onto a board of this size and this shape, then it's re referred to as the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, be careful that this is not the Raspberry Pi. It's, Raspberry Pi is a much larger board and is uh, more like a small computer than a microcontroller. Uh, but the Raspberry Pi Pico is a made by the Raspberry Pi company and designed by the Raspberry Pi company, but uh, with the RP2040 chip on it. So how do we choose between these hundreds of different uh, breakout boards and, and uh, tens of different microcontrollers. Well, the one aspect that we're going to look at is its speed. Uh, the Arduino runs at uh, 16 million cycles per second. Uh, the uh, ESP32 runs at 240 million cycles per second. So roughly 10 times the speed uh, on the ESP32 compared to the speed of, of, of the uh, Arduino, just uh, roughly speaking. So one would choose according to the speed that you require. Uh, also, you would want to choose according to the capability. Uh, the Arduino has a single core in it. The ESP32 has two identical cores. Uh, with a lot 
larger instruction set and it can do a lot more. So one would choose this if you needed quite fancy capability, including specifically Wi-Fi. But uh, of course, at that, that comes at a price. So if you want a small, simple, uh, cheap microcontroller, you'll probably use an Arduino. Uh, that's based on capabilities. Thirdly, as I said, price. The, uh, what you see is what you get, and what you pay for is what you get. So the higher capability chips are typically more expensive, and one will use that in, as a factor in, in deciding what microcontroller you want to use. Uh, some microcontrollers are very power hungry. Uh, others, you can uh, drive them off a, a little, um, almost a watch battery, uh, the type of battery that you put into your car's remote uh, key. Um, looks like a, a five rand piece. Uh, you, you can drive this microcontroller off that for months, if not years, if you do things correctly. So the power usage of a microcontroller is going to be a factor. You want to match that to your actual requirements. Then some microcontrollers can send quite a lot of current out to drive whatever you want them to drive, to uh, feed current-wise whatever you want them to feed. And um, so th if they make a relatively large, uh, if they are able to drive a relatively large current, uh, you can connect them straight to whatever device you want to drive a little motor or something like that. On the other hand, some processors can only supply very small current, and uh, then you have to add extra transistors and what have you to be able to drive a larger electrical or electronic device. Um, so whatever the driver current is, that is a criterion which you would consider in choosing a microcontroller and uh, then also physical size some of them are larger some of them are smaller uh, some of them the breakout board is large even though the chip is small and vice versa so uh, physical size match what you want uh, then it's going to be rather silly to read in an article that uh, someone has made a a doodum and a watch call it with an Arduino and you decide that you're going to make a doodum and a watch call it with a an ESP32 that's going to be a lot of hard work uh, typically you in the article that you read about this item that the guy has made he will include uh, programs and so forth and instructions and wiring and so forth and uh, so whatever already exists, uh, you're going to choose the microcontroller that that person used uh, in the design that you want to duplicate. So if there's a pre-existing design, you're going to go with that microcontroller which that person designed around. And then lastly, but not least in, of least importance, um, you're going to use the microcontroller that you're most familiar with. Um, there's no question. If you have made a lot, done a lot of work with one, you're going to carry on working with it unless you reach problems in terms of speed or capability or so forth. Then you're going to go and, and try another microcontroller. But the bottom line is if you know it, uh, it's going to be lots easier making another project with it. And uh, so familiarity with a specific microcontroller is uh, often a criterion. So what I've done is I've said, OK, this course covers these four microcontrollers or alternatively these four breakout boards. The Arduino, 
and specifically the Arduino Nano, the Blue Pole with the STM32 on it, the Vroom32 with the ESP32 on it, uh, and incidentally these 32s stand for 32-bit wide uh, data, uh, whereas the Arduino only has 8-bit wide data data don't worry about that first 32 it has 8 bit wide data and these have 32 bit wide data anyway and uh, we're also going to do the raspberry pi pico so we're going to stick with these four i'm not saying these are the only four and uh, neither these are the only four breakout boards you will find a lot of them mentioned but once you're familiar with one it's much easier to work with uh, another one that you might have available or that you require its capabilities. So let's look first at the Arduino. As I mentioned, the Arduino is <laughs> named after a pub down the street just because the guy couldn't think of a name quick enough and uh, his uh, circuit board uh, manufacturer was on the telephone saying if you don't tell me within the next five minutes what I must put on the circuit board it will be delivered next month and uh, so he and his friend said ah let's call it the Arduino and uh, this is referred to as the Arduino Uno uh, they were Italians and so this is kind of the first Arduino not quite the first one but uh, the first one that was very popular and uh, this is a picture of the original Arduino Uno. Roughly the size of a credit card. And uh, this is the microcontroller. Uh, still in the old format. They're much smaller nowadays. And uh, here is a USB plug, which you can use to both talk with it and power it. Here's a separate power jack that you can power it with 9 volts. And uh, here are a couple of uh, electronic pieces, bits and pieces, um, which are required to make it be self-contained. So uh, this whole board is a self-contained microcontroller, the Arduino Uno. We, however, uh, quite a few years have gone by since the Uno, and uh, even though it is still available, uh, it's actually much more expensive than the better ones uh, because it's not manufactured, I think, as, as such anymore. Um, and, and they've made Arduinos now a, a lot smaller. And this is one such Arduino that is much smaller, which we will be using. It's the Arduino Pro Mini. Functionally, it's almost identical to the Uno, uh, except that now we have this little chip. The actual board itself is about the size of two postage stamps. And uh, for those of us that still remember when there was a post office, and uh, this is the, uh, the actual microcontroller, a lot smaller um, package nowadays. And uh, so here you can pack the Arduino Uno power into a very small little uh, li little package. Um, it does not have a USB interface. Uh, in other words, you can't talk to it using the computer's USB, which is, in this case, possibly an advantage in that you're not going to be programming this microcontroller every day. Uh, or you will choose this one when you're not wanting to program it every day because uh, then um, why, why have the USB electronics on there and you just want to program it once and then it must carry on doing its work. And so these pins here on this side are actually there to be able to, to talk with it from another adapter over here. So we have an adapter which will convert from our computer's USB to the signals that this chip wants and uh, we'll be able to program it 
um, and then unplug the USB and the adapter and uh, this chip then is fully programmed and can carry on working um, into eternity. As long as it has power, it will keep on working. Now, we saw all those pins down the side of the, uh, of the breakout board, and those are the pins that we are going to talk to, uh, or use the microcontroller to talk to. Uh, so, whereas I said these pins up at the top there, those are the ones that we're going to use to program it. These are the ones that the microcontroller is actually going to be, be uh, uh, switching on and off or doing whatever we want it to do. And uh, so these pins are the ones that we are actually going to be connecting to, um, connecting the outside world to whatever we want to connect this microcontroller to. And uh, these pins have specific functions. Um, and this diagram actually shows the various functions and the multiple functions that a single pin can, can uh, uh, actually do. But, um, and it looks horribly complicated, uh, but it isn't. And uh, within a little while, you'll, you'll say, ah, oh, no, that, that diagram is very handy because uh, I know exactly what's going on there. Then, halfway between, you might say, the Arduino Uno, the original Arduino, and the Arduino Pro Mini is the Arduino Nano. Um, basically the same width and slightly longer than the Arduino Pro Mini because it includes a USB connection plug. So this connector here can be USB Mini or USB Micro or USB C and we'll talk about those later, the differences. But this will connect directly via cable into the USB plug on your computer. So this board again, we can talk to it directly from the computer just with a, a wire, a cable. And uh, it also has the, the same chip, or slightly, almost the same chip, and various bits of electronics on it, which make it also completely self-contained. Self but, as I said, we can program it uh, directly uh, whenever we want to. It's a question of plug it in and program it within seconds. And it also has a diagram with all the functions shown for the various pins of this, uh, of this Arduino Nano. And we are actually going to be using the Arduino Nano and doing quite a lot of fun things with it. Uh, later on we will also do Pro Minis, just so that you have experience as to how to program an Arduino without having the USB connector, as in the case of the Pro Mini. But we're going to start out with the Arduino Nano. Once more, don't worry about the complexity here. It's actually a lot simpler than that. Let's just look at it for a moment and uh, group the pins together and then one sees that uh, it's actually not that complicated. Here on the left, we have a mini USB or a micro USB or a USB-C connector. Um, and the various nanos come out with, with different connectors. Uh, we specifically will be working with the nano with a, a USB-C connector, which is the more modern connector. Uh, the USB mini is quite old. The USB micro is a little bit younger. And the USB-C is much more uh, recent. And... Uh, most cell phones nowadays uh, have a USB-C connector to them 
and most laptops nowadays have USB-C connectors. So um, that's why I ordered these with USB-C connectors on them. So you will need to run this. You will need a connector which has USB-C on this side and whatever your computer's USB port looks like uh, on the other end. You'll need that type of cable to actually talk to your your Nano. So this is this is the USB uh, connector, and um, uh, we'll maybe talk about it more in more depth later. But a quick way to identify a USB-C connector is look at it, and it's long and round, um, and you know, I'm just drawing it here. And if it has a sharp corner, it's not USB-C. In other words, all four corners are nice and rounded. Then it's a USB-C connector. Okay, on the other side, these are the pins, just like on the Pro Mini, with which we're going to program it if we don't have a USB available. And so they are there. Uh, as alternative pins, we will hardly look at these at all. Then, from here, D2 to D12, we have the data pins. In other words, these are pins which you can set to be at a low voltage, in other words, about zero volts, or you can set them to be at a high voltage for the for the sake of Uno, which is 5 volts, or the sake of the Nano, 5 volts. And uh, so you can make these pins go from 0 volts to 5 volts, uh, and the Arduino can read and see, is this high or is this low? And alternatively, you can say, OK, Arduino, you make that pin go low now. And then something happens and you say, hey Arduino, you make that pin go high now. So that pin will go from 0 volts to 5 volts back to 0, being driven by this Arduino chip or the AT Mega 328 chip. And so here are, are uh, these pins, D2 to D12. 11 pins and then we have a 12th pin on this side and this pin is special it does exactly the same as these pins but it's also connected via wires that go all the way around to this side to this LED and so when you make this pin high that little LED lights up and when you make this one low, in other words, 0 and 5 volts, then this LED goes out. So you can actually switch on a little light on your microcontroller um, to test things and so forth. And uh, you'll see this is D13, and there is the D13 LED. And... Uh, so that's, that's what that guy is there over there for. Then some electronics work on 3.3 uh, volts instead of 5 volts nowadays. And so this actually has a voltage regulator on it, um, two voltage regulators. The one feeding it with 5 volts from whatever you are feeding it in here. And the other one generating 3.3 volts. And so you can connect some other electronics thing that you have that specifically needs to have 3.3 volts to run. You can connect it to that pin and from your USB that you are powering the Nano with, there is a change from 5 volts to 3.3 volts and you can use that to drive whatever you are wanting to use whatever external thing you are wanting to connect to this nano. 
then there's also a reference, voltage reference here, uh, which you can use to measure anything between 0 and 5 volts, but we won't mention going to that in depth at the moment. And these are the pins to measure anything between 0 and 5 volts. And these pins, they're called analog pins, because you can measure all the voltages between 0 and 5 volts. And uh, that will give you a number between 0 and 1024. Um, so if, for instance, you have 2.5 volts, uh, then it will give you a value of 512. Uh, that's half of 1024. And so these pins are then used to, to read in a voltage and measure it. Eight pins for eight uh, analog voltages that you can measure. Very handy and used a lot in Arduino work. Uh, then <coughs> here is a 5 volt out just in case you want to also drive some other electronics. Not a big thing, not a massive motor or something like that, but a small bit of electronics. Here you've got some 5 volts that has been taken from your USB and fed into, into that point. Alternatively, you can use this 5 volts to actually power up the, the Nano, but that's nothing to be worried about at this stage. Then there's a pin for ground, in other words, zero volts. That's relative to that voltage. Everything else is measured. So when I say five volts, I mean five volts above ground voltage. 3.3 volts, 3.3 volts above ground voltage. So that's, that's the other wire. Whenever with electrical things, I'm sure you all have bumped into the fact that things don't work with one wire. They've got to have one wire going in and one wire coming out. And uh, this is the wire, <laughs> the, the ground wire coming out. And then here's voltage in. And that's a lovely thing about a nano, is that you can feed onto this pin anything between 5 volts maybe a little bit above 5 volts, let's say 6 volts, anything between 6 volts and 12 volts, you can feed into this pin and it will automatically inside itself convert that 12 volts to 5 volts and 3.3 volts. And so you can connect it to a car battery or uh, whatever you want to. Um, uh, two, two lithium ion batteries which will be a maximum of 8.4 volts, you can connect to this pin between the ground and that pin, and uh, it will then, out of that voltage, make your 5 volts and 3 volts that it needs to run. Very handy uh, uh, aspect of the Nano and, and many other chips uh, that you can feed it with, a, a, you might say, a coarse voltage, voltage about right, and it will regulate it to be the correct voltage that it needs. Then, going all the way around past the uh, these pins, on this side, we see there's another ground, there's a ground, and there's a ground, and there's an RST, and there's an RST. Um, historically, there are two on, on here, and it's just continued that way. Now, an RST is shorthand for reset. And this button is also a reset button. So, RST, or reset, is normally at 5 volts. But if you pull it down to 0 volts and let it go back up to 5, then the Arduino starts again. So whatever it does when it wakes up, it will wake up when you make this RST pin. If you short out, for instance, short out those two quickly and let go, the Arduino will wake up and start from 
scratch. Uh, and that's what the RST pin is for, both of them next to the ground, so that you can just short them and the Arduino starts up. And also, you can manually do it by pushing this knob. This is a, a touch, touch switch, uh, or a push switch, and uh, you just click that and the Arduino wakes up. And literally, once it's woken up, uh, obviously you've got to give it power before it wakes up. So you give it power and then you push this and it wakes up and it will then continue doing the work that you've put in there over and over and over again. We are kind of used to computers that we load them with a the program and then switch them off and go and sleep. Uh, microcontrollers, once they've got power, they start at the beginning, like after the reset button is pushed. They start at the beginning and continue on and on and on and on. It's a different concept, uh, a very handy concept, because you don't have to worry. You don't have to say, oh, I must save power because my Arduino is still running. Who cares? It will run as long as you give it power. So that's the reset pin and all the pins except these two. Now, the USB talks to the chip from your computer via, via what we call two serial wires. The one is a serial wire that comes in and talks to the Arduino and the other one is a serial wire that comes out. And that's all part of the USB. But sometimes we want to skip this guy. We don't have a computer nearby to talk to. We're just out in the Bundu somewhere and we want to talk to this Nano. Then these two pins are the equivalent of what comes in from your computer, but you can send information via these two pins from something other than a computer. And the RX stands for receive, uh, RXD, receiving data. So it actually that arrow is incorrect. It should point inwards. And transmitting data. So this one sends data out and this one receives data in. Uh, data being little pulses, little electrical pulses that mean something to the microcontroller. So those two pins are the receive and transmit pin. Transmit sends the data out, receive gets the data in. And that covers all of these gazillion pins that looked so scary a moment ago. And uh, we know what's going on inside the Nano. So, now we have to learn how to talk to the Nano and how to program the Nano. In other words, how to give it instructions because we want it to do what we want it to do. And this is how we're going to do that. This is the Arduino IDE. And IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. And so, this is the environment which we use to develop a program for the Arduino. And it's got a lot of things that make it life easy for us to develop the program. But then integrated with it is also the nuts and bolts and the switches and lights to actually send the program that we have written to the Arduino. And so we have integrated into one environment both the development of the, of the program, the running of the program, the testing of the program, and even the sending of the program to the Arduino. And later on we will also learn even the Arduino can talk back 
to our in integrated development environment. And so we're going to be using this a lot. And uh, since it's original development for the Arduino, people have uh, added information and uh, added a lot of hard work so that this will actually talk to all four of the chips that we will originally uh, initially being uh, looking at. Later on, we will look at more fancy ways of talking to them. But this guy, you're going to see throughout this course uh, until quite near the end. And we're going to do all of our work inside this integrated development environment. So let's, uh, let's get one going. So to get it going, you look on your screen of your computer and you will somewhere find this uh, emblem, the infinity sign with plus and minus in the, the, the two holes. You'll find it either there or there or somewhere scattered out with all your other shortcuts or icons on your screen, somewhere around if you have the environment uh, installed, which by this time I believe I will have done for all of you, uh, you'll find this, this uh, icon on your screen somewhere. You double click on that. And up will come this little white box, Arduino, Genuino, because at one stage there were issues in terms of what, are they crimped Arduinos or the real genuine ones? So they got this name as well. And uh, it says, you know, it's an open project developed by volunteers and so forth and so on. And uh, after a couple of sec sec uh, seconds showing you this, this um, flash screen, you will see the IDE on your screen. There's, there's our IDE and it's sitting uh, on our screen ready for us to use it. So one of the first things I'm going to do is, is uh, let's load a specific uh, program, except that at this stage I'm going to tell you it's called a sketch. And the sketch that we want to load is this one over here called 01 bare minimum. So in order to do that, we go, please excuse when there are two cursors on the screen. That's just a little artifact. Um, if you now go and have a look at this IDE, you'll see up in the top left corner, there's file. So if you click file, you'll get a list of things and you'll see sketchbook. And if you click on sketchbook, you'll see either one or more things and the one thing will be bright sparks. And then if you click on bright sparks or, or go through bright sparks, you'll see a list of all the programs and the very first one will be called bare minimum. So you can try and do that now. Unfortunately, uh, I can do it here on my screen, but it uh, doesn't help on your screen. <laughs> so uh, I can do it, and there I'm pushing file, and now I'm, I've gone to sketchbook, and now I've gone to bright sparks, and now I've gone to bare minimum, but you can't see <laughs> those names. But if you do it on your computer, you'll see exactly the list of things that I'm talking about. So if I click on bare minimum, it will load the program called bare minimum, or from now on we start calling them the sketch called 
bare minimum. Another way of doing the same thing, and let's just practice that while we're busy with it, is to push that button there. You see up here comes the, the word open on the right, because that button is open a sketch. So if we push that, we once again get the list of, of uh, options, and you'll see the bright sparks option there. If you take your cursor there, you'll see the bare minimum option there, and that's exactly the same thing. So you can either go via file, uh, file and uh, sketchbook and so forth, or you can go via uh, load, load sketch, or open sketch, bright sparks, bare minimum. So that's the first one we're going to, we have loaded already. And uh, now we're going to actually have a look, once we've loaded that up, we're going to have a look at our uh, integrated development environment. The top row of words, and I must just move this, I'm sorry, to the right. Uh, the top row of our uh, inter IDE, in other words, those words up there, right? Those words are what we call drop down memory uh, menus, which means that as you click on each one of them, a list of options drops down from that one, and you can then click on whichever option you want. So those are drop down mem menus. Um, then below that, and, and these typically have everything included in them, which you can do in this program. So somewhere in those drop-down menus, you will see a uh, see what you're looking for, if it's there. Uh, then below the drop-down menus, we have these buttons. And they are the, uh, the quick buttons uh, for the things that you do the most. This one, click that, it's going to save this program. Whatever's, whatever's written here is now going to be saved under the name bare minimum. If you click that one, it will open the sketch or a sketch. And the minute you click that, it will then open a dialog, uh, a directory where you can walk around and find the one that you want and load it just uh, like loading any file in a Windows or Linux machine. And then this one, by clicking that one, you start a brand new empty, empty sketch, uh, which is typically named uh, January, in my case, January 11D, is because the time that I am uh, busy Recording this is on the 11th of January. So pushing that one, you get a brand new brand new sketch, uh, which you can then write stuff in, but don't forget to save it before you switch your, uh, your uh, IDE window off before you close it. Right, so those, that's those three there. Then this one, if you click it, whatever's here, the IDE will run through it and compile it. In other words, take all these words that we've written here and convert it into a language that your microcontroller understands. That we call compile. So you can now push this button and it will compile everything in in this window okay so i'm even going to do that push that button 
add it compiles stuff and we'll see that it says global variables use nine bytes and and this window is a little bit too small at the moment because I've set the letters large for your sake but uh, if everything is white down here then everything compiled correctly um, the button next to it is okay seeing everything compiled correctly I'd like you to compile and write this program into my microprocessor microcontroller or microprocessor so this one compiles it this, this one both compiles it and uh, of course if you've compiled it here this one goes faster but then it takes the the uh, program in the language which microcontroller understands and actually writes it down your USB link into the microcontroller so I don't have a, a uh, microcontroller connected at the moment so when I push this I'll start getting red messages and it will say look this is not this is not so hot something's wrong attempting programming and so forth and so on uh, if everything has gone right this whole list of commands ends up with downloaded okay so uh, this isn't okay just because we are not connected to a micro controller at the moment and uh, then you've already seen this is where I write my list of commands in other words my sketch and this is where the actual IDE gives me feedback I'm busy compiling it I'm busy sending it to the board and here halfway between that and that now seeing it's tried many times and given up now it says prob problem uploading to board C HTTPS support Arduino CC slash etc 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 and if you click on that copy error messages it clicks that whole thing into your clipboard and you can go to your favorite editor and paste it there you know everybody who uses smartphones nowadays knows about copy and paste and so you copy it here paste it somewhere else and uh, you can put it in your in your uh, Firefox uh, browser or what have you and go and see what the problem is so uh, this is where the errors long-term errors come out this is where the errors come out as it's trying 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 and not succeeding and also uh, you'll see a whole lot of hashes you know what a hash looks like like that <laughs> um, you'll see a whole lot of those coming out here as it's uploading to the board and those hashes say it's busy uploading okay so if you see hashes going by you know ah, everything's going well and it'll end up by saying uh, download successful right so that's the story of our of our basic uh, IDE and I'll just go through it again with on the screen the top row of words are the drop down menus the top row of buttons are the shortcuts for the stuff that we use the most the uh, sketch button or the one right on the left um, is the one that you compile you see over here sorry I said incorrectly that's verify button and then upload button and so that's then the compiling button that is the upload button and then that one over there is start a brand new sketch that one is load or open 
an existing sketch. The one next to it is save the current sketch. And then this one I have not done yet. Kept that till last because it's kind of what we're going to use last. This one over here opens a typewriter. And if you want to send specific things to your Arduino, you can type it in that typewriter. If the Arduino, you want the Arduino to send messages to you, it comes also into that. It, so the Arduino can type on your typewriter page and you can answer back on your typewriter page. And this opens up the typewriter. And we'll learn how to use that later. It, we refer to it as the serial monitor. Uh, monitor from the fact that it is actually monitoring the messages going back and forth between you and the and the nano. And then the white box is where you write your sketch and the black box is where you get messages back. And then actually down here, I didn't even note that, down here it actually tells you what's all connected and or supposed to be connected to the IDE at the moment. It wants an Arduino Nano with an AT Mega 328P on it using the old bootloader and talking on dev TTIS0. Don't worry about the details there. Later on, you'll, you'll be able to just check up here whether you uh, it's done what you think it, it will have done. Right, so that's the, the ID and how that works. So we now are able to start looking and actually understanding a sketch. But that I'm going to give a little bit of a break before we get into that.